This is Seeking Delphi, episode number 22, Social Robotics and Symbiotic Autonomous Systems. I'm Mark Sackler. The future lives here. As artificially intelligent systems become more and more pervasive throughout human society, so increases our need to efficiently interact with them. Be they voice assistants like Siri and Alexa, bionic prosthetics, increasingly human-like robots, or eventually even AI wired directly into our brains, the way in which we communicate and work with them becomes ever more important. To this end, IEEE created its initiative on symbiotic autonomous systems. It's described as being created to pave the way for the development of a new field of symbiotic systems science to consolidate and advance technological expertise with emphasis on ethical, societal, and legal implications. The co-chair of this effort is Roberto Soraco, who has a background in math and computer science and currently heads the Industrial Doctoral School of EIT Digital. He spoke to me for this interview from his office in Turin, Italy. Roberto, good morning, and thanks for joining me on Seeking Delphi. Good morning. Thanks to you. So, Roberto, first give us a little bit of background on who you are and how this brings you to this initiative of IEEE on symbiotic autonomous systems. Okay. I'm a pretty old guy, older than I'd like to share. And uh, I, I spent uh, my, my career, my life, first in the research area. And I believe at the time, after uh, close to 25 years in research, the technology was all that was about. And if you just uh, didn't have some technology available, you just had to wait for a few more hours and you will get it. Uh, then I move uh, to the World Bank, and I understood that actually uh, what's important is the dollar. It's the dollar that really makes uh, the, the earth go round. And uh, so I, I got a completely different perspectives. And then I, I came back from Latin America to, um, to Italy again, and I was in charge for the Future Center, which was a place where we tried to, to put together uh, economics aspects with technology aspects with the social aspects. And there I understood that really you have to look at people if you really want to make progress and uh, have technology uh, do its job. So, Roberto, Tell us uh, specifically about the IEEE Initiative on Symbiotic Autonomous Systems. What is it? Why is it important? And where exactly is the symbiosis? Uh, the humans are the symbiotic part. And uh, when you're interacting with humans, you have to take into account uh, economics, because if a technology is not affordable, it's not going to be used, and the, its usability and its acceptability, and the cultural aspects and ethical aspects. So uh, actually, my background uh, was really well suited for uh, this kind of initiative. And uh, what we're looking at in this uh, symbiotic autonomous system initiative is uh, the trend that is uh, leading to an increase of uh, <clears throat> technology smartness, uh, heading artificial intelligence to robots, as an example, but also to plain vanilla things like the television. Uh, today, you can talk to your television and it responds uh, most of the time in an appropriate way. So you see these objects that are increasing their um, intelligence. And in the coming year, they will be increasing their awareness, the fact that we are around them and will be able to interact with us. At the same time, the second major trend that we are seeing is the fact that we are embedding technology uh, within ourselves. And uh, you see it's starting from the prosthetics area. Uh, you you may have lost a, a finger or a hand, a limb, and now there are prosthetics that uh, really uh, can help you a lot. And these prosthetics are becoming seamless in the sense that uh, you no longer think you have an artificial hand. You're just operating it uh, with your thoughts as if it were your normal hand. And in the future, you can bet that this is going to become very, very natural. Now, uh, this is leading to a, a very interesting area 
which is the fact that whatever today we are looking for, we are studying uh, for very specific requirement needs uh, like prosthetics, in the future they may become addition uh, to a normal, let's say, a normal person that has no specific deficit, but that understand that by using that kind of augmentation, it can really have a better performance. And you, you may see the first sign coming up in, in the uh, Paralympics where you have um, runners using uh, prosthetic limbs because, uh, unfortunately, they lost their legs, but they are starting to perform better than the normal runners, and they are asking to participate to the uh, standard Olympic Games. And curiously, uh, the, the normal runners are starting to say, hey, wait a moment, uh, they, they have something that uh, gives them an edge, okay? Uh, so this is a sort of augmentation. I was talking to um, her, you her from MIT, uh, you know, he lost his, uh, his uh, lower legs and feet, and uh, he worked to develop in his labs uh, uh, much more effective prosthetics, and actually he's, uh, um, he likes to go mountaineering, and uh, when he goes there, he changes his feet, his feet, and uh, is much uh, better equipped to 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 go uh, on uh, on mountains. And he told me that uh, some uh, mountaineering came to him and say, "Hey, can't you develop something for me as well? Even though I got the normal feet, because I would like to do something uh, the same way you're doing." So you see, we have got these two trends. On one side, you have. Uh, a smarter machine, getting smarter and smarter, able to interact with us. And on the other side, we've got ourselves that uh, through the use of technology, uh, we can uh, take care of disabilities, but we can also augment ourselves. And these two trends are going to converge eventually in creating maybe something like a new species uh, that is uh, partly uh, depending on the machine and partly depending on the human side in its uh, daily, li li daily life. Well, the advances in bionic systems are, are certainly fascinating, but there is a, another aspect to this, Roberto. Uh, when I think of man-machine symbiotics, it calls up something commonly called social robotics. That deals with our interactions with external machine systems, most notably robots, as they become more pervasive and human-like. Is that something you're dealing with in the IEEE initiative as well? Uh, yes, indeed, we are. I was just using prosthetics as an example um, because I think it's a very clear one. But, uh, of course, uh, we are interacting in very many ways with the machine around ourselves and um, uh, with objects, and these objects are getting smarter and smarter. So uh, the car, take a car as an example, they are becoming more and more able to do part of our driving. And uh, this is becoming seamless, so that sometimes you are uh, interfacing explicitly with the car, and sometimes it's just the implicit interface. On the way to a self-driving car, we have cars that are level three, they are called, uh, such as they, they are able to, to drive on a, on a highway, uh, keeping the lane or overtaking a car. Uh, at the same time, they are watching you and making sure that uh, you are uh, still keeping an eye on the road. And if you are not, uh, the, the steering wheel start to tremble uh, to catch your attention. Uh, this is a way of uh, interacting with the, with the human being from, from the machine. And also the way that you are steering your, your wheel is more and more providing information of where you would like to go rather than actually steering the wheels, which is something amazing in a way, okay? You are no longer with the electronic drive. Uh, you are no longer actually turning the wheels, but you're pointing where you would like to go, and you let the car do in the steering based on the road condition where there are bumps, pits all, and something like that. So yes, we are also looking at that part of the thing. Another term that I hear frequently in conjunction with this subject matter is the uncanny valley. It's the notion that as these robotic systems or even voice systems like Alexa and Siri get too close to be being really human, to be almost indistinguishable from humans, they will start to creep us out. Is this something that you've come across? Do you deal with it? How do we deal with it going forward? Well, first of all, I think that it's uh, an interesting observation, and uh, it's strongly biased by culture. 
I, I've noticed that uh, traveling to Japan, as an example, the attitude or to Korea, South Korea, the attitude of people toward robots is slightly different from the one uh, that you'll find in in the U.S. or in uh, or in Europe. Uh, it seems like they they are much eager to accept a relationship with a robot than than we possibly are. Uh, in in our Western culture, robots uh, are still a sort of a, a gadget in a way, uh, an amazing one. And the more they are performing, the more they look like you and the more interesting they may look like. But when you start realizing that, hey, they are a little bit too much like you, then you get a little bit nervous. <laughs> and this is the Uncanny Valley. Um, I think that uh, over time, we are going to get used uh, more and more to these kinds of things. And actually, I do not see a, a clear threshold, a disruption point uh, where you say, hey, look, uh, before it was like this and now it's different. Uh, actually, it's going to be a continuous thing. We are seeing continuous evolution and uh, we are not going to perceive, I think, this, uh, um, this point of, of change in attitude and, and culture. What we are going to see is that when you, you turn back and you look perhaps 10 years uh, behind you, uh, then you'll see a profound difference. I, I've noticed that, if you want, in, in a smaller scale, when uh, you you were uh, going through a, a tool booth in the highway, and uh, I remember 15 years ago when you heard this uh, voice uh, telling you um, thank you and have a nice trip or whatever, some people were, well, let's say, curious about that or something like that. Now it has become completely normal, okay? You, you no longer pay attention to that. So I think it has a lot to do about culture, and uh, we are going to, to find ourselves interacting with robots uh, without paying attention to it. I have already seen that uh, happening in the uh, in, uh, industry uh, where uh, workers are getting used to interact with robots and not, they no longer pay attention to that. Uh, they, they deal with them as if they were normal uh, workers, blue collars. But the industrial robots I've seen don't look anything like human beings, Roberto. And we're talking here in the uncanny valley getting creeped out when they get really, really close to being human-like. Well, if you take uh, uh, Baxter from uh, Rethinking Robots, it's a robot that is, uh, uh, has been equipped with, uh, with a screen uh, that looks like a head. And on the screen, uh, you, you'll see eyes. Okay, and uh, these eyes are looking at you, and they are, uh, you know, uh, showing emotion. And uh, you you are teaching this robot by picking up his hand and showing him, uh, show it, I would say, or him or whatever, what uh, what it should do. And uh, the the latest version of Baxter are actually able to watch what you're doing and learning just by seeing. And even more than that, they are starting to understand what is the, the dynamics of the of the teamwork. And they come back to you and say, hey, why don't you do this way and I'll do this way because it's going to be much better. So you see, the, we are coming to a point where the, the machine is taking up the, the lead and tells you uh, what uh, you should be doing in order to share the work in a more efficient way with them. I, I think that the, this is, a, is really a progress in the direction of a symbiotic relationship. Okay, uh, another term that I've seen, in fact, I think it was in the description of the IEEE initiative that was sent to me as part of the prep for this interview, is superorganism. What is that and how does it come into play? Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, you, you may have seen, pretty sure, uh, starlings. And uh, these are birds that are usually flocked together and they they paint in the sky some amazing uh, figure, okay? Because they are flying together, they change the way they're going, and and it really looks like there's a, a sort of a, a orchestrator among them that is directing these amazing choreographies. Actually, there's nothing like that. It's just a, a very simple set of rules uh, that, uh, by being applied by a multitude of single elements, create a super organism. And what you're seeing is an emergent behavior. Now, we are actually the emergent behavior of our neurons. In our brain, you've got some 80 to 100 billion neurons and uh, trillions of synapses. And what's happening is that the single neuron, the single neural circuits is pretty stupid. Uh, you can uh, swap uh, one of our neurons with one of a snail, and you won't notice a difference. 
what happens is that when you have so many neurons and synapses interacting together, you start to see an emergent behavior. And this is a sort of superorganism. We have plenty of these in natural environment. And uh, we are working uh, toward a situation where our artifacts are reaching such a, a volume, such a number, tremendous number, that you will see emerging uh, behavior coming up. Intel is working on, on drones, and uh, they have shown some interesting choreographies. And some of these latest choreographies are based not on somebody that's telling you, you drone are, are going to do that, you are going to do that, but actually they are setting general rules, and then it's up to the drones to do the, the choreography. And uh, we are going to see this with the IoT, Internet of Things. As soon as these things, and there are already billions of them, are going to be uh, tightly connected, we are going to see this emergent behavior coming up. And this is the superorganism we are referring to. As I look at this, I see applications, uh, consumer, industrial, biotech, military. Are there any other applications that you're looking at right now that might shed some light on where we're going with this? Well, you know that uh, IEEE is, uh, is very strong in uh, several areas, and one of these is education. And uh, today, what you have is basically education that has not changed significantly from the one in the 18th century. Uh, yes, we have replaced uh, books, uh, paper books, uh, with uh, digital books. Uh, we are much more efficient in assessing a book because we just Google for it, okay? Or we use uh, IEEE Explorer to, to search for a specific articles. But the, the learning process has basically remained the same. Now, what we are looking at is, uh, is some way that uh, may project us into the future of education using this uh, symbiosis with uh, with system that is now an education system, I can have a replica of myself, what I call my digital twin, that knows exactly the, the, the things that I know, that has exactly the same skills that I have, that has read exactly the same books and the same paper, and that misunderstood the same kind of articles that I did misunderstand. You know, And what happened is that you can use this digital twin in conjunction with some artificial intelligence program, with some deep learning programs, to find a way to help me uh, when I need to know something. Now, the first thing, of course, is to understand what kind of gap exists between the things that I know and the things that I need to know. And uh, this can be done by some artificial intelligence program that look at the digital twins and look at the context I'm in at that particular moment, is able to tell, okay, you need to know this kind of thing. And at that point, knowing what I know, it can help. This system can help me in learning in the most efficient way what I need to know right there at that particular time. You can easily understand that this is something that is very, very useful for industry, particularly at the, at the time, and it's going to get uh, worse in a way, <laughs> where uh, knowledge is, uh, is changing so rapidly, where you are working at place and you get a new device, a new machine, and you need to interact with that machine. And and it, the, the cycle is so fast that basically you would have to spend most of your time training for the new machine. And by the time you're, you're set, there's a new one. So actually, training on the spot is, is very, very important. Uh, another thing is that uh, the capability of looking farther down the lane. And so see, okay, guys, you, now you know this kind of thing, but I know that in, uh, let's say, a week time or in a year time, you should be knowing something different. So at that point, I take any opportunity that I have to nudge you toward that particular knowledge. And this may happen as I walk in the street. Uh, I, I can be attracted by this, uh, this uh, system to, to look at a particular thing and saying, hey, look at that. You see why that is working that way? You see that new car, it has a new uh, driving system and so on. It works this way and so on. So taking advantage of the context to make me learn and get me prepared for the future. I think that this is a, a very interesting area for application of symbiotic systems, where in this case, you're, you're in symbiosis with yourself, with your digital twin, and there are services that can be played on the digital twin to really help you out. Okay, for one final question, Roberto, let's look at the far future 
out toward maybe uh, Ray Kurzweil and his singularity. There are those out there that are advocating, Elon Musk being a primary one, that we need to actually merge ourselves with artificial intelligence to keep control of it, essentially. And uh, at some point, clearly, there is more and more actual direct interface to the brain down the road. What do you? What's your take on that? And is I triply uh, looking at that for the far future? Well, l- let me start by saying that uh, this far future is already here, um, because uh, <laughs> I can tell you that sometime I am at the theater with my wife, and uh, she's telling me, "Oh, look at the doctor. Okay, he might be forty-seven year old, fifty, something like that." And without even thinking, I, I take out my cell phone. And I Google for that guy, and I tell her, oh, he's 48. He was born on March 3rd. And uh, so this is an extension of my brain, and it has become completely seamless. And this is going to become, as you mentioned in your question, even more so in the future when we will have uh, direct interfaces uh, with, uh, with our brain. Now, I, I'm not thinking about having wires or wireless connection to, to our brain, but something more subtle. Uh, like having an ambient that is uh, fully aware of where, who we are, uh, what we're doing, where we're looking at, and able to interact with us in a seamless fashion. Imagine an ambient a room where all surfaces, be it the table, be it the chair or the wall, uh, can potentially become screen, and they can attract my attention, providing information. They, they can read between the line of what I'm doing and provide information. This will be a seamless extension of our intelligence, of our capability. And it's coming, I think. And and the the fact is that it's coming in a way that is not perceivable because it's just a tiny little step at a time. Uh, What IEEE is doing is to look at technology that makes this possible and at the same time consider the social implication, the ethical implication of this because, of course, the more potential you have in uh, leveraging from technology and the wider the gap with those that do not have access to this technology and the bigger social implication and ethical implication may derive from this. So looking ahead is important, not just because we want to be smart uh, guessing the future, but uh, we want to be smart in taking the next step. Roberto, this has certainly been fascinating stuff. I'd like to thank you for your time today and wish you continued success with the IEEE initiative. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I met and interviewed Hugh Herr at this year's South by Southwest Interactive Conference. You can hear that on South by Southwest 2018 minicast number four. It seems to me that systems that become part of us, bionics, are somewhat less of an obstacle to smooth interaction. It's more of an engineering problem, mechanical, electronic, and biological. But it's those external systems that become more and more of a problem as we approach the uncanny valley. I don't know about you, but when I think of the possibility of actually interacting with the robotic hosts of HBO's Westworld, it really does creep me out. And yet, if it was purely virtual reality inside our heads, rather than real brick and mortar, so to speak, I don't think it would bother me. My thanks to IEEE and Interprose for their assistance in arranging this interview. And of course, to Roberto Saraco for being my guest. Be sure to subscribe to these podcasts on iTunes for your iPhone, Player FM for Android, or on YouTube, and follow us on Facebook. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, I'm Mark Sackler.